first on CBS Mornings, Arnold Schwarzenegger joins us now. How are you doing, sir? Well, Terrific, God. thank you. Uh, I mean, I try to dress up a little bit here, but I cannot even come close to you guys. Oh, please. Talking, <laughs> about, talking about competition, I mean, this is like unbelievable how well coordinated That's you guys are. That's quite the compliment I mean, right there. I know, the, but the, coming from a man. The suit and the tie and the whole well, thing. We'll take the compliment. Shoes. We'll take the compliment. But coming from a man who is probably, I was thinking, Governor, that of you've climbed the peak of the mountain, literally everything that you've ever done. Yeah. And it, it's, there are people that are really, really good at one thing, mm -hmm. maybe two things, but you have lived the life of a few men from your bodybuilding career, acting, of course, in politics as well, and now author, um, and you have done this before, but let's tap into this book because you call it being useful. Um, why do those two words, be useful, stand out to you as it is the title of the book? Well, as I explained in the book, uh, it's something that my father quite frequently said, you know, kind of like, uh, be useful. He always wanted us to work, he always wanted us to learn, and he always wanted us to not only think about ourselves, but to also think about other people. So when I, for instance, was getting into bodybuilding, you know, and I was training, and I was standing in front of the mirror and flexing, my father would say, why do you always look in the mirror? Why do you look at yourself? Why don't you just go and, and, and just work out? And if you want to build muscles, by the way, why don't you go and shuffle some coal for the neighbor? Mm. The woman is 80 years old, she cannot do it herself anymore. You should be doing it. Chop some wood for the neighbor. Do something, you will get muscles like that. This is, <laughs> there's this famous uh, uh, European champion in boxing, Laszlo Pop. I talk about it there. He was always known to chop a lot of wood. So my father would say, look at him, he became European champion by chopping wood. Yeah. I said, you can do the same thing rather than standing in front of the mirror and flexing your muscles. And all so it was always about being useful. And then that was so in my mind all the time that even when I kind of sleep in sometimes, let's say to seven o'clock, yeah. I heard his voice. Be useful. Yeah. What are you doing now? Sleeping in like a little baby? You know, so I, I hear that and him complaining about it. So mm. I think that, uh, that it motivated me always and to, to be hardworking. And that's why I have a chapter in there also about work your ass off. You know, that it's all about hard work, hard work and giving something back. And here are the rules and the tools you can use in order to be successful. Mm. You, you talk about your dad, but he was very physically abusive with you. And oh, yeah. yet you very proudly talk about him in this book. And the book is inspired by what he used to tell you, Ven Shun, Den Shun. Yeah. Which means... If you do something, then go then all then out. Go, yeah. go all it. out, you know, just don't just, you know, tiptoe around, just go all out. I mean, so it, it, that's why I talk about that when you pick a goal for yourself, you know, don't go for the little goal, go for the big goal. I think this is another thing that I learned at home, and it just, just, it was the kind of mentality when I grew up. And so I, I just want to let people know that you don't have to go for the little things, go for the big things, go for the stars. That's what yeah. I always did. Mm. I was not interested in just becoming Mr. Austria. I wanted to be Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia, to be the world's greatest body. You wanted to do it all. You wanted, wanted to do, to it, do all. it all. Yeah. And then, you know, then you figured out how far can you go with the whole thing, For right? sure. You, you would know. Another tool is sell, 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 um, along with being useful. How do you communicate that to your kids as a parent? Well, I, I did that. Uh, I mean, you know, raising kids is... Not easy. A much tougher job than being Mr. Universe, I can tell you that. Yeah. I mean, it is wild, especially when you have two daughters and sons and you, you, you deal with, with, with the boys, deal with the girls' issues and all of that stuff. But we uh, I had, uh, of course, my wife was very good in being a great partner with raising the kids. And so together we did a good job in really giving them kind of the important messages, teaching them the important messages. Tools that you got to go and educate yourself, you got to be passionate about things, you got to have a certain goal. This is the most important thing is that kids today don't have goals. Mm. And so what I'm trying to do in this book is to let them know that it's the most important thing is to have a goal because you have nothing, if you have nothing to chase, yeah. then why are you going to school? Why are you working? Why are you doing anything? So you have to chase something. You have yeah. to have a goal, whatever that may be and then it makes it much more fun. Governor, speaking of your family, in the book, you briefly mentioned your affair. You say uh, it blew up your family, you blew up your family, and quote, no failure has ever felt worse. Mm -hmm. This book is all about the lessons you've learned, the perseverance. Yeah. Um, what did you learn from that moment that someone watching today might benefit from? You know, 
it's don't screw up mm. is the is the only thing I can say. I mean, I mean, that's what I learned from it. You know that you can really make mistakes like that, and it can affect not only you alive, but it can affect everyone around you. A ripple effect. And definitely in this particular case, a personal failure definitely affect my entire family. And yeah. uh, you know, so but there, there there is also failure that I talk about. This professional failure, like when you lose a Mr. Universe contest, when you lose a competition, yeah. when a, a movie goes in the toilet and it doesn't do well, or as well as you thought it should do, or whatever it is, you know. So I think we have to deal with failures, and we have to deal with successes. And we, we appreciate have to learn from that. that. And thank you for your transparency because your point. honesty is a reflection of a lot of people and what they're dealing with. Rich Paul joins us now. Welcome. We are so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank Rich Paul, you. number one, I wanted to see what you were going to wear today, because in the book you said uh, being fly was something you discovered early yeah. on was a mm -hmm. leadership skill. Yeah. Number two, I just think, Rich Paul, you were on 60 Minutes last night. I know. Wow, wow, wow. Blessed, blessed. Yes, what that blessed. must mean to you. I got really emotional from, last night in front, of my, in front of my friends. Um, it means a lot. My grandmothers would be, they would have hit... The, they did hit the roof. Like, I'm sure they <laughs> did. Yeah. Number one, we were all talking about your book. Your book is so well done. I learned a lot in your book. For instance, Nate, I always thought that dice was just a roll of the dice, but there's a skill to dice. No, that's doubt. A whole I don't other know story. that either. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot. But sort of this, like Steph's jump shot. I feel yeah. like that's how. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good form. Back you gotta then, have good for form. sure. Yeah. You yeah. say that in your book, su your superpower is understanding what people need. You never got a chance to be a kid and hard truths make us stronger. What is your yes. hard truth as you sit here today? I mean, it's the, the book is my hard truth. You know, all those experiences, when you read the book, you get hard truth after hard truth after hard truth. And you know, talking about, like you said, the streets, talking about things that we felt we had to do, um, mm -hmm. not glorifying it at all, No. but as an entrepreneur, as a young black man in my community, there was no, no real options for us from an entrepreneurial perspective. There was nobody asking to help you with a business plan. There was no real outlets. Yeah. And so you turned to what you thought was the right thing at that mm. point. And a lot of times you did it knowing that it was actually the wrong thing, but right. you tried to find some right within the wrong but Rich, doing. But, that but makes this sense. is what's so interesting, though. People hear uh, about a story like yours, and they expect the the hustling, the addiction, the the gambling that you succeeded despite all that. But you say you succeeded and became who you are because of all that. Talk yeah. to me about that. And the because, lessons you took from that. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. shapes you, right? Everything we did that that you thought was a detriment to you today, it puts me so far ahead of the competition or the competition to be because. They don't have those experiences. They don't know what it's like to be without, pretty mm. much. They don't know what it's like to have to persevere despite. So every day I'm being, you know, talked about. I'm being, you know, things are being fabricated. You've seen anonymous articles where mm -hmm. people come out and anonymous, anonymously talk in a negative light towards I me. Bet you. Right. But they don't realize that that was my life every day when you walked outside your mm. door. Mm. Everything in that environment was negative. So those things were shaping. I didn't know it. God yeah. knew it. He was shaping me for right. what was in what front was to of come. me today to come. Yeah. You know, this book, I believe, is for all readers. And all readers, certain chapters yes. um, that speak to you differently. I love the value of being humble. Um, yeah. In it, you write, my teammates were stars on the court, but I never felt envious. I was a star in a different sky. And then he went on to say, heard at the time, there's so much value for me in loving basketball and eventually being humbled by it. I love that because most people fall in love with a craft, they get hurt by it, they leave it alone. Yeah. You stay close to this game and look where you are now. Is that a, a big lesson that you want people to take away from It's that? a huge lesson, especially for kids today. I, I just knew I was going to be an NBA player <laughs> until right. my dad told me. But you said me. you're five eight and a half. Despite the height no, and the yeah, small hands. Yeah. But you don't know but that, But Webb right? was a guy. He was yeah. playing in the NBA. But when my we were dad kids. told me, you're not, right? But it didn't discourage me from not being a part of team because hmm. I didn't make it about me. I was, I played on the, the second team, right, where we had to make the starters better in practice. And through that, I learned what it was like to be a great teammate. Mm. But there's so, still people today, Rich, that don't think you belong in the rooms that you're in, that ooh. don't oh, yeah. think you belong at the table. Well, they don't think it. 
I'm not sure if they don't think it now. Yeah, they forget. They I don't think. want it. Mm. Oh, right. This <laughs> is, by difference. the way, this is very cringing. There was a shift. People. Yeah, they don't yeah, want it, very but they can't stop it at this point. Now it's about families, especially black families, not being, not looking at it and saying, oh, I'm not gonna work with this person because I don't want this person benefiting from right. my son, et cetera. We, we right. have to break that now. Right. Number one, it's, it's, been, it's been broken a little bit, but yeah. we still have a long way to go. I, I think you left the book in such an interesting place. To me, it, it cries for a sequel. You know, listen, LeBron, everybody knows you and LeBron are very tight. LeBron might have opened the door for you and gave yeah. you an opportunity, but you took it and ran with it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it should be minimized. But there's also a part where I'd like to know more of your journey, how you became what you became. And I also want to know about Adele. Yes, please. <laughs> only, beca well. only because only because Adele has said uh, in the audience, my husband is here, I'm a wife. Would you just like to clarify? Would you like to share with the class? What would you, how about, what would you like us to know? You know, Gail, <laughs> I don't really talk about my personal life publicly, yeah. but if I'm going to give anybody some tea, it's going okay. to be... Thank okay, you. Gail, Thank with you. the okay. tea. Okay. All right. Speak it to the I, microphone. Let, let me say this. We are, um, she's been great. She's, yes, of she's, course. she's, I think we've, I think she would agree that we've definitely helped each other. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a good space. You know, we're in a good space, happy. She's a, Rich. she's superb. Rich, she says wife and husband, and you say she's been great. I just want to give you one more chance here. No, As a husband I'll myself, say, yes. you I might didn't want say to say she's been. She's been great for me, yeah, yeah. we've yes. been great for You've each other. You've been great for each other, yes. though. That's yeah. what I said, we've yes. been great for each other. You don't and use don't, those terms. And again, though. I understand how, I'm starting to understand how people go, oh, he said this, he said that. Right. I'm just not the type of person to put my personal life, it's not for the media, it's okay. not for All right. the paparazzi. It's for y'all. It's for us. So, so, yeah. so when I see her, her or... when I see her, should I say, hi, Mrs. Paul? You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I hear, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. There's a lot going on that you're not. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me say this. You grew I'm not worried. up uh, yes. idolizing hustlers because you didn't have businessmen to look up to. Thank you for being that. Yeah. Thank people, you. And hustler, just so we know, it's not a negative. Oh, Don't not at all. Exactly. Not at Mark all. Mark Zuckerberg's hustling every that's a day. Yes. Yes. Every day. I'm just saying. Yeah. But now young kids can look at you and identify yes, they can. with you. Yes, And that's what it's for. Yeah. Thank you. You don't have to. Your start doesn't have to determine yeah. your finish. You can appreciate yeah. everything that happens to you, as you put it. That's yes, a you great can. way to put it. Yes. Melissa Etheridge joins us now. Uh, how many standing ovations did you get at the yeah. one? I, was, <laughs> I mean, three, four? As soon as you came out, people were like, ah! You start the show. I mean, it's a so, great show. Aren't standing ovations just exhausting? <laughs> oh, it's just, it's just, it's all, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. I love it. It's awesome. It's I mean, people, people love this show. As you say, it's so dramatic, but it's yeah. also very funny, and you get the backstory to your songs. When did you realize that you were able to write this as a memoir, but also perform it as mm. a show? Well, I think, um, I think during the pandemic, you know, we all had a time to really kind of reflect and, and it was a good time for me to reflect on my life, everything I'd done, and, and you know, things were happening. So um, I, I realized, wow, I really want to tell my story again. I, I wrote a book, yeah. you know, years ago for the, for the first, you know, quarter of my life. And, and so much has happened, and I've learned so much. And, and um, realizing that my life is, is, is more my art now than, mm. than just, you know, just my passions or desires, but it's the whole thing. And so I just started telling a story and helped by telling the book and then, then taking that and, and making the show from it. It, it all just worked out. Yeah. Yeah. You said from drama comes great, uh, great <laughs> songs and you've had a lot of drama. One of the most powerful moments when you talk about Beckett's death, your son's death, you know, the lights go down and it's just a, a silhouette spotlight of you. I wonder how you're able to do that night after night. I, I after also wondered that. Yeah. You, I wonder how yes. you're able to do that. Well, I, when I wrote that, part of my life has been very open. Yeah. And I have, I have chosen to be truthful and share what has happened in my life. From, Why did you from, want to share that, though, something that's so painful? That's because I, I find great healing in it, okay. mm. in, in taking it off of me, because losing a child, especially to opioid addiction that way, is you, you, take on, you can take on so much guilt and shame. Yes. And that was like poison to me, and I already knew before that happened that that, that, can, that could make me sick. I, I had already been through cancer and understood yeah. the stress on that. So I, 
the greatest way for me to get it out is to, is to state every night, my son would want me to be happy. Mm. This, the, and, and, and take it and believe it. And I go home with that belief and I sleep, my son would want me to be happy. Yeah. So this is what I'm gonna yeah. do. Yeah, you talk about um, being honest and, and living in your truth, which you have done for, let's say, decades now. <laughs> I believe being truthful is the hardest thing humans try to do and you do it um, fearlessly. Uh, why did you decide early on in your career to come out in a time where it wasn't necessarily accepted? There were stakes. As much on a, there grand, were stakes. Sca on there, a grand scale. Yeah. Absolutely, because it, 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 there came a point where as a, as a musician, as a songwriter, I, I wanted people to, if they're enjoying the music, to know where it came from. I didn't want to portray something and then have all the, all the reward go to that and oh. me feel empty. And mm. so after, it was my fourth album that I finally said, look, I, I have to step up and if people are gonna stop listening to the music because I'm gay, then they're not listening to the music. But were you afraid to come out? Because it could have been a big business decision that could have gone totally the other way for you. Um, you know, or were you like, and was there some conflict? Sure, there was some unknown. They actually, no. I, people say, you know, did it did it hurt you? And and I went from selling under a million uh, records and out, al you know, an album to over six million, seven million <laughs> records. Well, on that point, <laughs> Melissa, I, I really wanted to. I mean, so there's a moment in the in the show mm -hmm. where you talk about being signed, and mm -hmm. uh, the agent who signed you or, the, or, or uh, said the future of rock and roll is a female face or has a female face, and that's true. That's historically true. Uh, and then Jan Wenner recently has a book called <laughs> The Masters, right? Oh. About rock and roll interviews, the greats. No women, no women. Women apparently not articulated enough, mm. not significant enough. Mm. Did, do you have a missed call from Jan? Like, what's going on? <laughs> How do you feel yes. about this? A missed no, call from Jan. <laughs> that has to bother it's, you. Yeah. It, it, okay. The Yes, of course it bothers me in a way that it's it's sad. It, and it, it, it actually, a, a little bit of it, it set me free. Because I used to get a little tortured by... The uh, the mainstream rock and roll media huh. and and how they didn't pay you know it was always the last thing or not included or it was all these guys it was all the guys all the white guys all the white guys and then it's like oh now I get it because the mainstream rock media was all white guys okay mm. and so I understand that that's not where my legacy is I'm not looking to them to give me a legacy anymore so I'll talk about legacy myself. I know you like the Kansas City Chiefs. No. Are you are you on board with Taylor and, and Travis? What do you think? I swear, my house has, uh, the two, any given day, there's two things in my house we're talking about, Chiefs or Taylor Swift, <laughs> right? So when that came together, it was like, wow, my worlds have collided. This is crazy. Yes. I love it. I love the attention she's brought to. I, I've loved football all my life and I enjoyed know, yeah. it. Yes. So I just love that she's there. And, and Travis is a wonderful human being. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. He's great. He really is. Any given Sunday, Melissa Etheridge, thank you very much. My great pleasure, to have you here. Thank you. We're happy to say that Raina Greenberg and Ashley Hesseltine join us in the studio. I love when we say that you talk very candidly about friendship, sex, and then we say, and you interviewed Senator Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> what sex tips did she give you, Ashley? She <laughs> said, <laughs> her tip was basically pick your battles. Pick your with battles. Your partner. You no. know, don't fight over unloading the dishwasher, and we, we love that. We did ask her. But, but this is what's so interesting about the two of you. I listen to it and I think, is there nothing off limits between the two of you? And I've come to the conclusion that no, there isn't. But maybe there is, Raina. I don't, I think all the time, where's the line? And I haven't found it yet. Uh, as long as we're only talking about our lives and not embarrassing other people, we feel like we can pretty much talk about everything and normalize every topic in everybody's life. Because, Ashley, you have uh, sparkle eyes. I love that's That's what you call your boyfriend, sparkle eyes. You're in a relationship. Raina is not. Does it make it difficult what you talk about on the air? We're in a throuple, actually. You're in a throuple. Um, uh -huh. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I've... I consider him all the time in the way I speak about different things and my past, and he supports what I do, what we do, everything that we talk about, and he's wonderful. But yeah, it, it's on your mind, but yeah. it certainly hasn't changed our dynamic, our friendship at all. At all? I'm curious about that because you've been together six years, and often when somebody's in a relationship and the other one isn't, it normally can put 
um, strains on the on the friendship. You say no. I, I mean, I feel really lucky. People ask you all about that all the, all the time. time. It's yeah. such a hot topic question. I feel really lucky. She picked a person I really love. That the three of us are in a group chat. I just barrel my way into that relationship, <laughs> and I joke all the time. It would be my worst nightmare if she picked somebody I didn't like. But I really like him, and I think it can be really tough on a friendship, of course, to feel like you've been left behind or this yes. person found love. Why can't I? Why them? Not me. Um, but that hasn't been the, the case for us, and I feel prioritized all the time. I feel that our business is prioritized. Yeah. And um, it's exciting for me because I'm open for business. So no, <laughs> you're open for it. I always say I'm alert and available. You'll like this when favorite daughter Kirby was born. Oprah came to see us, the baby. Mm -hmm. She's wearing a T-shirt that says, "Husbands come and go, best friends last forever." And That's I go, true. <laughs> "Why would you wear that T-shirt?" Maybe she, maybe she knew something I didn't at the time. But I thought that was an odd. T-shirt to wear at that particular time. If she ever calls him her best friend, I would be like, <laughs> no, he's excuse not me, best what? <laughs> he keeps trying to slide in there talking about best friends. I'm not best friends. I have a best friend. <laughs> what, did she, what did she see? I also like you guys have an ick factor game that you play or that you talk about. I, I think this is so so funny where you say uh, one woman's it, one, one, one woman's husband is another woman's ick. And I think that that's actually very true. So we put together a list of icks, and I want to know where you weigh on that. Okay. Very quickly. Wearing socks to bed. She I love wearing socks to bed. It's, yeah. so, it's my ick about her. Yes, it's probably everyone's ick about me. But A guy that calls their mom mommy. N Get out of here. Me. I will never talk to no. you again. You know what you did. <laughs> so, celebrating a birthday month. I don't like it. I don't mind it. My mom <laughs> does it. <laughs> You don't mind it, you do. Depends on which birthday. If you're turning 40, 50, if it's like a, a big birthday, 42, get out of here. <laughs> We're doing one day. <laughs> okay. Talking to a pet, a guy, talking to a pet in a high-pitched baby voice. I can't. You have to... You're, you're, I like that. It, there's a line, Gail, of how high-pitched it is. <laughs> What do you is say? Is it higher than mine? Because mine's high. <laughs> it's not for me. I don't want the dog. To, I don't want to ever hear that voice come out of your body. I'll never respect you again. Okay, asking for a to-go box at a restaurant with only one bite left. <laughs> I have seen people do that, and I'm thinking, oh, it's okay. A, it's honestly a red flag, and you should run. That's uh -huh. a crazy thing to do. Yes, the only exception is, are we going to eat it in bed together later? Yes. The one bite. Girls got to eat. Congratulations. Very nice plug. Congratulations, guys. Congratulations. Thank you, so much. Thank you, so much. you two clearly have a good time. That's Ashley Heseltine and Raina Greenberg. We thank you. Very happy to say Alex Toussaint joins us now. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All I can say is your classes are so hard. It's but a tough class, love, yeah. Classes, <laughs> tough love. a very big guy on the steady cam said yes, that you saved him during the, during the pandemic. A lot of people tell you yes, that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I try to keep up with you, but you were so good. You were so popular and so well liked, but it didn't start out that way. No, I want not people at all. to know a little bit about your backstory. You got kicked out of elementary school, you got kicked out of high school, you got kicked out of the military academy. Yes, ma'am. What was wrong with you? Clearly, were you <laughs> angry? What was happening mm, to you? I had a problem with authority. Um, most yeah. authoritative figure at the time was my father. Yes. Um, he got diagnosed with colon cancer when I was about seven years old, and that caused just a certain level of trauma within the household. So it became this revolving door of me getting in trouble at home, then getting sent to school, getting in trouble in school, coming back home, and I was never able to break the cycle. Mm. Thankfully, my father, just being aware and understanding that I had no sense, sense of discipline and self-accountability, he didn't want me to end up a statistic, yes. dead or in jail. Yeah, your dad was yeah. very, very tough on you. I mean, talk about tough love. Tough That's love. what you do in those classes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma he was very, very tough, but it did reach the point, and it really touched me in the book, where he called you one day after all the fraction, and he said, Lex, I'm proud of you. Yes. After you had accomplished all of that. Yes. All of this, and we'll talk about that too. What did that mean to you, that call? Everything. That was the number one sense of validation that I needed in this world. Getting that sense of, I'm proud of you from a black father, I think we searched for it for our entire lives, and that was the day I went from existing to living. What do you mean? 4.30 in the afternoon, April 6, 2016, he calls me and says, I'm proud of you. I will live my entire life to try to prove him wrong, yeah. and I was able to prove myself right. So I go, I tell people all the time, I existed in this bubble of negativity. Mm. Now I had that release of validation from my father, I'm able to live this thing called life to the best of my abilities and without any level of resistance. Wow, and you found yeah. it on a bicycle. Yes, ma'am. You'd never been on a bike before. Never been on a bike before. Bike. Never, never. But that bike helped me move my mind and my body and helped me allow 
a new perspective of life. And in the book, I talk about how you view yourself as how you treat yourself. And every day I push those pedals, it carves out the identity of who I want to be and where I want to go. But Nate, so, Alex was cleaning the bikes. Right, yeah. right. We're cleaning, cleaning the bikes. Mopping cleaning, the floors. Yeah, you were the yes, janitor at a, at a flywheel studio. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Cleaning the bikes. And then you got on and the rest is history. I want to talk about another moment that you said um, kind of changed your perspective, which is hitting rock bottom. Yeah. And it forced you to reevaluate your life. How did that moment change you? It was one of those moments in life where you hit rock bottom, you know from then on out, you have to go up. I know for now, I don't ever want to shrink myself into an environment I've outgrown, and I have to continuously do the work every single day. Emotionally, how did you know you were at rock bottom? I did not know. Until I got into a spin bike and started moving my mind and my body, that, that informed me that I was in rock bottom, because I started to pull myself from the dark space into light. I never was able to identify rock bottom when you're in it. And I think mm. for a lot of people in this world, you're never really able to identify what that feels like until you get pulled out of it. That's good. So what I try to do every single day is move with the purpose and execute with an intention and help people that are viewing themselves in that dark space, pull them out to this other side called life in a beautiful perspective. So Alex, you already mentioned a little bit about this, but I want you to really break down for our viewers what you mean by stop existing yeah. and start living and this 48-hour rule, yeah. that's really what I want. I mean, I'm yeah, intrigued so I like that by that. Too. This 48-hour yeah. rule yeah. that you talk about when you're thinking about turning your life around. When it comes to the stop existing, I think a lot of people in society live in this mindset of I can't, I won't, because they're scared to fail. My entire life, I would never even tried anything because I was scared to fail. But I understand now, failure. Fail, first attempt in learning. I understand that when I fail, to quote Will Smith, I fail fast, I fail now, I fail here, and I fail forward. That informs me and provides me information, and most importantly, confidence to continue to go every single day. First attempt at living, oh First wow. attempt in, first attempt. You know attempt. what else I like? You don't believe in the fake it till you make it. Not right. at all, not and, at all. And that, that surprises me, because a lot of, I've had moments where you fake it till you well, make it, you don't do that. Well, that's social media. Everybody does yes, it nowadays, Gil. Now, that's when you're raising- Why don't also, you believe fake it till you make it? When you come from a, a family of Haitian immigrants, there's no such thing as faking it. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents had to do the work and put our family in a position. They see right through that. Right, right, see right, right through right, that, yeah, yeah. There's no level They'll of tell you right up. Yeah, you They'll want to tell you. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Exactly, exactly. One of the things I realized- I got bon. Yeah, you understand, you understand. So what do you believe? Don't fake, what do you believe? Don't arrive to your destination unequipped. Take the time to go through the journey. Understand the trials, the tribulations, the setbacks, the adversity. That lets you understand who you are. And if you understand who you are at core value, it allows you to know where you want to take it. So don't ever rush the process. I'm all about trusting it. I'm not asking for myself, asking for a friend. Do, are you available? <laughs> I'm not available. I'm thinking about Who's you, that friend? What's I'm her not name? Available. No, I won't say her name. <laughs> I'm, not I'm focused on this journey right now. <laughs> oh, you're not, not available. available? No, ma'am. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, Alex. All right. All right. He said it's a two-seater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 I ain't riding so low. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Alex, you saw it. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Well done. Mike. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Damon Wayans Jr. joins us right now. Good morning. Hey, man. How are you? I'm good. Appreciate you, you joining us. That's a really us. good summary of the show. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, Just that like small that. clip, right? Yeah. All right. Um, you're known for acting. Yep. Stand up. I mean, you pretty much do it all. Uh, this is relatively different. Hosting a game show. Man, yeah. How did this come about? So I've always been like a really good fan, a really big fan of like game shows and and uh, and shoplifting. Yeah. So and shoplifting. This combines both. Of those. <laughs> it is <laughs> thrilling. It is. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I just I just really like I like the idea of trivia mixed with the physical challenges. You don't usually get both of those in one show. Yeah. Right. You either get the the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or the American Ninja Warrior, and I feel like this is kind of like. Both of those. But yeah. I love your tagline, get in, get out, get rich. Yeah, yeah. And I think people must have a strategy before they get in there. And do you think they lose it once they get in? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, once you get in there and there's so many options, mm -hmm. you know, like when you were a kid and you went, like, you went into a toy store and your mom was like, just one, one thing. Yes. And you're like, <laughs> it blew your mind. <laughs> I just, you know, it was like, it's like that. It's that feeling where you just, everything goes out the window, you see black, you just try to grab whatever you can. No, they have a thing, guys, on the show where you're either a grabber uh -huh. or a gabber. Yes. Yep. And I said, do you think you're a grabber or a gabber? Someone who answers a thing or goes in and runs and gets the stuff? Yeah, I think we know our roles right here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. I what just catch I, footballs. You're yes. a gabber. Yes. Yeah. All day long. You're a gabber. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. 
What about Damon, you? I'm, I'm very curious. All right, so your father is <laughs> Damon Wayne's uh, senior. Uh, yes. You've got uh, your uncles, Marlon and Sean, uh, very funny people. Uh, the most talented family. Can't forget very talented. Industry. Can't forget Aunt Kim. Yes, yes. Aunt Kim. Yes. Aunt Kim. Yes. Aunt Kim. Yes. Uh, and then Nephews, you come along. nieces galore. I mean, did you at any point look at them and just think, you know what, I'm going to go into management consulting. Like, I'm not going to do this whole, <laughs> I'm not going to try to go I'm into I'm going to be an bit. accountant. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be in front of the camera. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, so I wanted to be an animator initially. I used to, like, oh. draw all the time. And then um, one day, I accidentally Open one of my dad's checks, and I was like, huh, "Is that a no, phone number?" No. Or <laughs> no, be an actor now. So, Damon said you accidentally opened one of your dad's. Yeah, I was like, How's "Oh, that, that must be for me. It's Damon Wayne." Oh, yeah. okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, everybody but, always talks about in living color. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Will there yeah. be a living color with the next generation? Don't you think that's I a great would, idea? I would love that. Would Honestly, you? Honestly, I feel like the world needs to like laugh, yes. like really hard, and I would, I would welcome it. You know, with Keenan's blessing, of course. Yeah. But, uh, but, but yeah. But you know people. I know some people, yeah. Yeah. Well, have you ever broached it or said, hey? So I feel hey, like uncle. they've visited it a couple of times, but ne it never really, like, actually landed. But yeah. I uh -huh. think if I were to take the helm, okay. then maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it would have to be done right, though. It would have to be done right, and I feel like we need the equivalents. We need, like, the equivalent of, like, a Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at all the stars. Like you have Jamie, Jamie Foxx, Fox, David, David Allen. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like how, how do you find those people? No I mean, doubt about it. They're out there. You Speaking of finding media. people, though, Jenny Mae... She's yes. a, a great co-host in Rate the you. Cage. Yeah. Um, you know, how was it working with her? And, and being able to ad-lib and show both of your personalities. I thought, you know, Jeannie is just, like, so... She's so good at her job. She's so, uh, like, empathetic. Like, she really got the contestants to, like, you know, like, really be involved uh, with the whole process. And, and I just think that she's really funny and fun. And it was just natural. It wasn't like we weren't faking it. Like yeah. we were trying to get along. Right. And I just, I always love that when you don't have to force it. No doubt. Are you working on a new comedy special? A new comedy? Like stand up? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm always like, I'm always like, this is going to be the year. And then like, I do a project that takes me away from the stage. So I, I think once I give the right attention to the stage, I'll be yeah. ready to. But you still hit the, the stage. Oh, though. I do. Oh, yeah. daddy hits the stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, speak, speaking of Thank dads. Thank you, daddy. <laughs> yeah. Think, okay. Daddy oh, hits the stage. That daddy took you back a little stage. bit, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking about Magic Mike. So relax, yo, relax. What are we talking about? Um, no, no, but uh, speaking of we're dads. We're talking about Ray um, okay, your, right. your father is one of the most multi-talented dudes in the industry. Yes. We know about the family, but specifically yeah. your father. And he is one of the funniest stand-up comedians, one of, one of the goats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, for you to follow in his footsteps, to be named after him, what is it like to carve your own way in this industry? Yeah, yeah. First of all, my dad is like one of the funniest, yes. like super funny stand-up. Yeah. Not my top five, but he's solid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David Wayne. He's me, man. I'm not going to put him in my top five. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I, I feel like it's an honor. You know, he, he when I first started stand-up, he would bring me, like, on stage with him yeah. all the time. So I kind of, like, I, you know, I got... I got the drill. I got the drill factor. Yeah. You know, I got. I, he taught me everything that I know, so I can't really. You know, I don't really compare myself to him. I just take the things that I've learned from him and yeah. from my family and apply it to my cry. All right. Well, I'm hearing whispers You're about the show between y'all and the works. I don't know hey, if it's going to happen, but I hopefully it does. Anything. My fingers crossed. You know that's for mean? sure. Once these once these strikes get taken care of, you no know doubt. I mean? Damon Wayans Jr. Thank yeah. you so much. Nicole, good morning. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Thank you. I thank love you. the title of this book, Nothing Is Missing. Thank Explain you. to our viewers what that means. So, I mean, I think that we've all lost so much, if for nothing else, after the pandemic, kind of our idea of what we thought the world would, would give. And what's unfortunate is we get caught up in that idea. We yeah. start saying, what is missing? What can go back to the norm? But instead, if we shift to mm. nothing is missing, I lack nothing, mm. and everything I need in this moment has already arrived, it allows us to move forward with so much more grace. I want to talk about your philosophy of living boldly, making yes. bold decisions, because you attracted a lot of attention. When you quit live <laughs> in front of everybody, everybody. Yes. 2019, <laughs> can you just briefly take us to your mindset there, there, why you quit that way? And after you did it, did you have a, oh, 
bleep, what have I done? <laughs> of course. Who doesn't have that moment, right? But I always like to phrase it as, I didn't just quit my job, I hired myself. Mm. So I had planned, you know, to give myself a promotion. I built a business, I had a nest egg, I prepared. But when it came time to quit my job, I mean, call it burning down the bridge so I couldn't run back across it when I was scared. What was your right? job at the time? That you I quit? worked in corporate America for a Fortune 500. I'd been mm -hmm. doing that for a decade in business development. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was jumping into, becoming a private consultant, but nevertheless, entrepreneurship is scary, you know, but bold moves are the beginning of anything great. And so uh, that was just the first of many. Let's talk about when, we, when you were younger. You write that you were born into poverty. Yes. And you realized early on that no one was coming to save you. Yes. It reminds me of something I once heard. Uh, she needed a hero, so she became one. Mm. Um, what did you... Nicole, I, like how you I like how you absorb... Yeah. Oh, yes. Nicole said, that's absorb me. That. That's yes. Right. yes. Yes, I'm always a learner. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yes. Um, <laughs> and what did you realize about yourself when you kind of came to your own aid? Sure, sure. So first things, I mean, obviously we're, we all have systemic and societal circumstances that aren't our fault, right? We all have cards that we've been dealt that we want to honor and respect, but ultimately we do have our own agency. And it was important for me to realize what tools do I have and how can I use and leverage those to change my circumstances? Yeah. And that's what I mean when I say no one's coming to save you. It's that any big need or desire you want has to be initiated by you. Mm. Your, your parents play a big role in your, yes, your success do. story. You said you're, they're from Ghana. You, you said you have an immigrant mindset. Mm -hmm. Your father, unfortunately, is no longer with us. He, yes. he passed mm -hmm. away. But I am curious about what your mother makes of your success today. Because she seems proud of you, but she's oh, also yes. like, uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. so, anyone who has immigrant or old Southern parents, they understand. I called my mother up just the other day, and I told her I was in the book. And she's like, you know, this one is nice and all. I, thank you for putting me in your book. <laughs> but there's still time for, for medical school. You can still have twins. There's so much more you can still do. <laughs> and I was like, more, Mom. I'm talking to Gail's. <laughs> So what we more are. can I do? Can I but do? doesn't she say, you know, I had a hand in this. Of course, You're good, but yes. I had a hand in it. Yes, this. and what's beautiful is she does also remind me that, look, this is something that's been long in the works and it's part of your ancestors, and I, I laid the foundation for you because I want you to run with it. So she's supportive, she cheers me on, but she also reminds me that she wants to be a super grandma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before we go, really quickly, we got 30 seconds, but yeah. you're also the mom of three adopted daughters. Right. How did boldness play a role in how these young girls came to your life? Well, I met these girls after driving down a street in Baltimore, Maryland, and I very quickly, within 30 days, moved from mentor to mommy, and I just knew I I had to be there That's extraordinary. in any ways they needed me. So it was bold, but it was so right. You talked your way into Wheel of Fortune. I mean, <laughs> I know, I know, Gail. Yeah, that story. Oh the gosh. book is loaded. That's okay. right. You've got to pick up this book. Uh, Nicole Walters, thank you very much. We're thank cheering you, for you on. With the violence top of mind for many Americans right now, parents are struggling with how to talk to their children about what they are seeing and hearing. For some more advice on how parents can discuss the conflict with kids, we're joined by Jamie Howard, a senior clinical psychologist at the Child Mind Institute. Uh, Jamie, good morning. You've seen the images. How do we even begin to have that conversation with our children, and what is the right age to even bring it up? Right, I think around 10 or so, our younger children should just be protected and shielded from this. This is too much for their development to, to make sense of. Um, and then when we do talk to kids, we want to start with open-ended questions, right? So with our, like our, say, elementary age kids, something like, what have you been hearing about what's going on in the world? And then go from there. They may or may not be hearing a lot about it, but we want to be available to answer their questions. It's always better for kids to hear about disturbing news from trusted adults. If they say they're not hearing about it, should you go into it anyway in, mm. in the anticipation mm. that they will eventually? I think what you want to do is you want to start small, right? You you don't have to get into a lot of details, but you can say, well, there has been a conflict overseas and there's another war going on and you're safe. And if you hear anything about it, please come talk to me. You can always come talk to me if you feel confused or have questions about it. Now, how does that conversation change when you're talking to someone older, like a teenager? Like teenagers, exactly. So they do know about it because they're on social media and they're just aware and they're thinking about these things. That's, that's the nature of a teenager. They start to think in more complex ways. So I would be more pointed with them and say, what do you think about what's going on in Israel, in between Israel and Hamas? What, how do you feel about it? Tell me what you, what you guys are talking about. What about the social media impact? Because 10 to 16, 18, I mean, I mean, a lot of children have phones. 
We've seen the images again, and as a news organization, we have to be so careful about, yes. you know, making sure that it is from that region and what we're seeing There's is, is authentic. information out there. Absolutely. Yeah. We have to authenticate it. So what do we tell the kids when they come back and right. say, have you, have you seen this, Mom or, so or Dad? So these images are... You're lucky are, if they do that. Right. right they're, yes, if they come to you. That's what we want. That's right. why we want you to open up this conversation so they, so they do come to you. We don't want kids seeing these images. We actually don't even need most grown-ups to see these images. When we have human-to-human -human violence or assault, we know from the trauma research that this is particularly hard for people to make sense of and to cope with. It's particularly traumatic. So those images from the initial terrorist attack are really hard for kids. The teenagers I'm working with are telling me it's hard to stop looking, mm -hmm. but it's just that these images are in my head when I'm trying to pay attention in school. They're in my head when I'm trying to sleep at night. Teenagers already don't get enough sleep. So I would really try to take off social media for at least a few days to get mm -hmm. through this initial phase where there's so much imagery out yeah. there. It makes you long for our 80s childhood where yes. the, you were watching some things that were tough, but you were watching it on a single screen in the living room in the and living you room. could engage with right. it. But that's yeah. that. those days are gone. Uh, speaking of, of not knowing some kids are going to have complex questions particularly <laughs> older kids mm -hmm. who's yeah. right in this situation who's wrong in this situation why is this happening mm -hmm. and you know unless you've got a phd sometimes the answer is i really don't know mm -hmm. I, I, for a lot of people is it okay to say that it's definitely okay to say that. What we want to do is facilitate trust and an open conversation. But if you say to your kids, listen, that's a big question that I actually don't know the answer to, but why don't we look into it together? Why don't we gain more knowledge on this topic and come back? I'll do some of my research. Let's meet again on Tuesday. Just set a date and then make sure you do follow up so they trust you. I know Quickly. you're here to talk about kids, but what's your advice to the adults? To the adults. So a lot of the adults I've been working with this week, we're talking about focusing on your behavior. So take action in ways that you are able to, if that means making a donation or peaceful advocacy. But also, it doesn't help the situation. Even if you might feel guilty, it doesn't help for you to not be functioning. So what we want is for our behavior to be our anchor. I get up, I eat breakfast, I go to work or I go to school. I'm kind to my family and friends. And, and this is actually what we can focus on, what we can do during these hard times. Put on your uh, oxygen mask before you put it on yes, your child. Yes, exactly. Like in the plane. You got yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Jamie Harrod, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. It. A new Netflix docu-series tells the story of the controversial e-cigarette company, Juul. It's called Big Vape, The Rise and Fall of Juul, and it follows two Stanford graduates who initially aimed to help people quit smoking, but may, at some point, unintentionally sparked a youth addiction and vaping epidemic. Here's a preview. When the kids' issue was really taking off, James and some executives came up to my office, and, you know, they were telling us how concerned they were about kids. And, you know, we said, look, you know, if you're really concerned about kids, you wouldn't be doing the kind of marketing you're doing. You'd get rid of the flavors. And they said, we have this great idea. And I said, do you mean to tell me that you can communicate with these devices in both directions and control them remotely. And you can measure second by second how people are puffing on it, the nicotine delivery puff by puff by puff. You could make that product a million times more addictive than a conventional analog cigarette. In a statement to CBS News, Jewel Labs says that over the past years, it's committed to re-earning the public trust. And that statement goes on to say that some of the ways they've tried to do that is by ceasing distribution of all non-tobacco, non-menthol flavored products and halting all mass market product advertising. Jewel Labs also says underage use of Jewel products has dropped by 95%. The series is based on the book, Big Vape by Times' Jamie Ducharme, and she joins us now along with the series director, R.J. Cutler. Thank you both for being here. Uh, I think the story of Jewel is an absolute tragedy, and I'll say that for any smoker in my life, I tell them, quit smoking traditional cigarettes now and switch to vaping if it helps you quit. That is my position on this. The fact that we haven't had clear messaging in this country, I think, actually literally kills people. I'm really curious, Jamie, when you started writing about this, what initially attracted you? Well, I began covering Juul in around 2018, at the time when many teenagers were beginning to Juul. So at the very beginning, I was interested in that, sort of what is vaping doing to young people? What are the health effects? I'm a health and science reporter, so that's what drew me to it. Um, but over time, the story really evolved for me into a business story, into a character-driven story. Um, and that is what led to the book that has now become the series out today. Yeah. What, what made you pick up the book and say, man, this has <laughs> got to be a four-part docuseries? 
Well, I see this as a, a great example of kind of the central narrative of our moment, which is the unintended consequences of big tech. Uh, they didn't set out to reignite a youth uh, smoking uh, epidemic, but they did. Um, they set out to create a smoking cessation device, and the twist of the story is the damn thing worked. It, it actually They succeeded. Yeah. The engineering's work. fantastic, the design is fantastic, but the way the company brought the product to the world was a disaster. Yeah, and their intentions, I think, in the beginning were pure, but once you see the number of kids who were using it, because it's not good for kids, then we've taken a turn. And at the end of the doc, it, it basically says, it was really a big marketing error. Is that where we fall on this? You had a great character with a mother um, and her son who was doing it, and the yeah. son, the jewel guy comes to the class, and the son said, yeah, but they're not saying the right thing. The only one who will believe me is my mom. And then mom, Meredith, went on a tear. Do you think the bottom line was the product was a good one, it's just that the marketing was bad? I always say Jules is a story of missed opportunity. Uh -huh. The product could have been good. It could have made a strong impact on public health, but Jewel, the company, made countless mistakes um, and clearly got their product in the wrong hands. It's so tough, though, because when it comes to cigarettes, unhealthy foods, and drinks, when you market, you know who you're marketing to. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that kids listened and enjoyed what Jewel was putting out there is always strange that they kind of walked it back and said it wasn't their intention. But what does Silicon Valley, in their perspective on how they played a role in the idea of public health. Where do you stand on that argument? Well, the, it's, the, the, the question is, can the Silicon Valley approach to public health work? I mean, we see uh, big, uh, high stakes uh, finances at work in the way that we're approaching the cancer crisis in this country, right. up in the Boston area, and, and it's working. Public health and finance are working together with scientists and engineers to solve this crisis in, in, in extraordinary ways. In Silicon Valley, when the, say, when the principles of Silicon Valley are applied to public health as they were with the jewel, it wasn't successful. So mm. what does that teach us? And we hope that this series will stimulate a conversation towards yeah. that. Can I just ask you, you know, our friends in the UK are very different in the way they approach vaping. They say vaping is less harmful than smoking and a very effective tool for quitting smoking. I'm reading from the National Health Service. In fact, you're roughly twice as likely to quit smoking with a nicotine vape compared to the patch or gum. That's what they say. They'll even give you a free one there to help you get, get off you cigarettes. Started. To get you get off cigarettes. Here, we got none of that. We haven't approved a single device. And 500,000 people are dying a year. Which of us is right? Those guys overseas or our government? Well, one of the uh, characters in, the, in the, our series says, one of the people we interviewed says, one day your grandmother is gonna use a, a vaping device to help get her off of cigarettes, and she's gonna live another five years. Right. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Right. And that's a perspective. Uh, Jamie can speak more to the, what what uh, studies have taught us about which government is In less than 30 seconds, Jane. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, your bottom line is what? Sure, I think the hard thing is that vapes are not that old, really, in the, in the world of health research. It can take decades to it's fully true. understand. Yeah. So that's the tough this part. This is a complex story, and the complexity is what we explore in this can series. I, I think your it's series simple, is very you know, good. I started to watch yeah. one and I, watch I, all I do think it's Educating and entertaining. I, if you're a an, I think if you're an adult smoker, it is pretty simple. Quit the cigarettes. Yes. Any alternative is better. It's an exhaust pipe. Uh, R.J. Cutler, Jamie Ducharme, thank you very much. Yesterday, President Biden called the assault an act of sheer evil, his words, and renewed his vow to support Israel, saying there is no justification for terrorism. We're joined now by Republican Senator, that's Tim Scott of South Carolina. Senator Scott is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. As you know, he is a 2024 presidential candidate. Senator Scott, thank you so much for joining us this morning. <clears throat> good, good morning, Gail. It's good to be with you. It's really good to hear that Tony's family, I know he has a couple of kids in Israel. Yes. Thank God yeah. they're safe. Yes. Thank you, Senator. We're following that story as well. Yes, sir. You know, President Biden told us yesterday that Americans are being held hostage. 20 Americans are missing. What, if anything, can you tell us about their status as we begin with you this morning? Well, one of the things... Thank you, Gail. One of the things that we should put in context for the American viewer is that 1,200 dead in Israel is like 40,000 killed in America. What we know without any question is that there cannot be a, a hint of daylight between 
us, the United States of America, and Israel as they respond to this attack. That is absolutely essential that they know we have their backs. We stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel, number one. Number two, we need to make sure that they have all the resources that they need. The good news, Gail, is over the last 10 years, we've had a strong partnership with Israel and their military. So we know they have the resources, but there will be a desperate need as this pulls out and goes on. We will have to be in the position to refill some of the assets and resources that will be depleted along the way. You know, Senator, I, I hear you saying there should be no daylight between the U.S. and our allies in is Israel. And, and so I was surprised to read your comments about President Biden uh, yesterday, maybe it was the day before. You said he had, quote, blood on his hands and was complicit, your words, with Iran because of unfrozen funds. Yes. That, I guess, in your view, uh, led to this attack. Do you have evidence that there's a direct link with Iran and that, that the $6 billion was used? Well, here's what we know without any question. Hamas thanked Iran for their support and their assistance. We know that for sure. We know that the president of Iran said, without any question, the $6 billion will be used any way we want. We also know, we can see it reinforced throughout the globe, that when there's weakness in the White House, there's blood in the streets. Whether that's in Ukraine, when President Biden said a small incursion might not be that big of a deal. When he said to Putin, if you cyber attack some areas, just don't cyber attack these areas. And frankly, when you negotiate and give $6 billion, you create a market for hostages. And the response to that has been uh, Iran has, and Hamas working together without much of a question. 90% of the money that comes into Hamas comes from Iran. Yeah. Senator, I'll just say that the, the White House's perspective on this is that none of that $6 billion has yet been used, so you can't blame that $6 billion for this attack. But I think the bigger question is more well, philosophical, and, and it goes to the, the question of, of unity and that united front. You're absolutely right that when America is divided and weak, it can embolden people abroad. With that in mind, why did you think it was a good idea at this early stage to make this comment about President Biden? Well, there's no question. If you see that his weakness invited the attack, the negotiations funded the attack, and the first response from the White House, from the administration, was to tell Israel to stand down. It's that kind of activity that creates daylight. And if we go a step further, let's look back. The JCPOA uh, was a disastrous nuclear deal that gave Iran an opportunity to see a runway to a nuclear weapon. We've seen that the advanced centrifuges have been more aggressively pursued than they have at any other time in recent history. There's not a question about Hamas working with Iran. The only question is how much intimacy was in that relationship. So I don't, don't only stand by my comments, I would reinforce those comments that any time we have weakness in the White House, there is blood in the streets. Yes, Senator, uh, we understand drawing lines, but there's also a difference between hard evidence. But I, I want to talk about funding. Um, congressional Republicans have sure. been fighting funding for Ukraine for quite some time. Uh, now, how do you feel about the support of uh, combining the, the, the funding for Ukraine and also the support for Israel? Well, there's no doubt that you, you may have heard some of the talking points from the White House. One of the things that they're looking at doing is uh, combining funding from Ukraine to our border, which is an absolute crisis in our country. We now know that uh, citizens or nationals from Yemen and Iran have crossed over our southern border, which means one of the most important things that we can do to fight perhaps a sell here at home, is to close our southern border. Thank God that is finally common sense. We knew it as the American people. The government finally caught up. So combining funding with Ukraine, Iran, uh, and the border is really important. And then, frankly, funding for Israel, uh, actually reducing, uh, taking back the $6 billion. It's one of the efforts I have. That's why I mentioned Iran. I would love to have the Secretary of the Treasury come in and talk about the importance and explain to us why was it so essential to release $6 billion to Iran and is there a way for us to claw back if those dollars are still in Qatar? Uh, Senator, uh, do you support U.S. military uh, boots on the ground to help uh, free the hostages, particularly the Americans? 
There's no question that we've seen uh, our, our some flagships in the United States Navy move into the Mediterranean. That's a very important, good step to show strength. I believe will be a great deterrent. Number two, having our special special operation forces prepared to assist in the hostage negotiations and bringing those folks back without any question. We don't know how many Americans have been taken. We know there's 14 dead, 20 missing. We have no clue on how many hostages they have. But we do know that we must make sure that our firepower and our negotiation skills are in the region to help bring back those hostages safe. All right, Senator Scott, thank you very much for joining us this morning, and thanks for the comments about my kids. They are safe, and, and I appreciate your concern. Uh, come back soon. Thank God. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank y'all. Joining us now is New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, who was actually in Jerusalem when Hamas attacked Israel. He's a Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee and uh, very experienced in these matters. Senator, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Mm. Uh, so what a difference a week <clears throat> makes. You were there to talk about peace and progress toward it. Instead, we're in a full-scale wa full scale war. Israel says its goal is to break Hamas and to free the hostages, and it wants people to move out of the way right now in order for them to potentially do so. The UN says this is going to be a humanitarian disaster. Do you agree? Look, at the end of the day, Hamas and terrorist groups like it target citizens. Democracies are stronger when they follow the rule of law, and that's what Israel is subject to. They have a right to self-defense. We all should support that. Um, but as, Senator, as President Biden has already called out, we need to make sure uh, that we do everything we can to avoid a humanitarian disaster. So th to, to be specific, the U.N. says that that 24-hour window to move the, the civilians out of northern Gaza into the southern part of, of the Strip is not enough time to move that many people. And also, by the way, they have nowhere to go in the southern part of, of the area because Egypt's border is closed. Given these constraints, given how tough it is to move people, given the reality of the hostages, and some of them being Americans, what do you think Israel should do or America should do to get people out safely? Both move civilians, if they can aid in that way, but more importantly, free the hostages. Well, I've been involved in furious discussions in this week that is transformative. Remember, Friday night I was in Israel celebrating some chastora, uh, uh, enjoying a Shabbat dinner. The next day from my host, to my guest, lost family members there. Wow. Hamas, and people forget this, this is a terrorist organization, and its founding isn't to stop the state of Israel, it's to kill Jews. It's a Hitler-like, Nazi-like, ISIS-like mission that they have to yeah, destroy No Jews. Jews between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. Yeah. Right, no, no, they're, they're looking to build a kind of caliphate on the destruction of populations. Mm. And, and what folks forget is what they have done consistently. Every time there is a real pathway to peace, Oslo Accords happen, or Bin uh, and, and Arafat get the Nobel Peace Prize. What is their response? Targeting Jews in Israel, bombing buses, killings, kidnappings. And so here you have, and remember, I stayed in the region to continue meeting with the UAE, Bahrainis, people who joined the Abraham Accords. This was something incredible that was happening. You had the Saudis for the first time uh, talking openly about normalizing relations with Israel. As MBS said on Fox News, every day we get closer, but the Palestinians must remain a, point, a part of it. My effort in Israel was to meet with Palestinian leaders and Israeli leaders to continue to push that message. We have an opportunity at peace, at two-state solution. And so what is Hamas's response? Just like after the Oslo Accords, when there's a real chance for the Palestinians to have peace, security, and their own state. The organization not only was founded to kill Jews, they founded and built themselves by terrorizing, look at the Amnesty International reports, by killing Palestinians, abducting Palestinians. Any opposition they have, they have brutalized. Mm. And so this has to be seen in the context of what my mission is to continue, and why I'll go back with a bipartisan group of senators to Saudi Arabia within days to try to keep us on a pathway to peace while we also try to resolve this conflict. Hmm. But right now, Senator, peace seems to be very elusive as we sit here today. How do you take out Hamas or cripple Hamas without affecting all of these innocent civilians? That's, that's what's so frightening to people as we sit here today. Right, and that it's was- It's great to hear you all were making progress with peace, but that's not where we are right now. Right, and, 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 and as quiet as it might be kept, and we should make it plain, as I met with Arab leaders around the region, as well as people in business, uh, people in the arts, people in journalism, everybody knows Hamas for what they are, mm -hmm. an ISIS-like terrorist organization who wants to thwart any pathways to peace. 
the response to that has got to be not letting them be victorious. And in fact, when you have Arab people, Arab leaders in other countries, telling me that we must destroy Hamas, that they are the impediment, that they, who have a great allegiance to the Palestinian people, know the destructive instincts of this organization that targets children, that targets elderly, uh, that abducts and kills. Uh, so innocents. how do we let them not be victorious? Because right now, I'm not going to say they're winning, but right now it's very disturbing what is happening, what we're seeing. Do you, you know, support a ground invasion? I, I support right now, and this is what I'm furiously working at, is to protect civilian life. Mm. Hamas knew when they did this what the response was going to be. Yeah. Mm. They, use, they use their own people as human shields. They use Palestinians. That's not their own people. When you have Arab leaders telling me how they violate the Koran, how they violate the principles of Islam, this is a Nazi-like organization that is using human beings, children, which is a significant part of the population in the West Bank right now, in, in excuse me, in Gaza right now, are children. Uh, they knew what the response was going to be, and they did not care. Yeah. We have talked about the role that Iran has played in the Hamas attacks, um, and there have been some reports that U.S. has frozen or refrozen, denied access to that $6 billion um, that they have freed up. Can you confirm that at all? Yeah, look, right now, that the deal that was made to release U.S. hostages uh, was to allow $6 billion not to be used for Iran, but to be used for humanitarian purposes. Right. That money has now been frozen. A dollar of it has not gone out. But it brings up the important point, is those people who have been empowering this ISIS-like terrorist organization, uh, we need to start asking tough questions. And even those questions. Senator, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm so confused about the money. Is it frozen or is it not frozen? Has it not gone out because we froze it? Or is it just hasn't gone out because they haven't asked for it and hasn't been released? So we've gotten assurances in the Senate that it has been frozen. Uh, the intention of the dollars was never to go to Iran at all. Uh, it was a lot of checks and structures have been set up so it would only go to humanitarian relief. But even that now has been So uh, that stopped. disinformation out there that the $6 million has been used by Iran to help fuel what Hamas is doing. It, it is very frustrating that this issue that is not an issue, none of those dollars has come out. It's distracting us from what should be as Americans yeah. our fundamental concern. Yeah. Senator, uh, I need to turn to a topic that in, in many ways pales in comparison to what we're yes. going through right now and what we're discussing, but it is important to the future of the, and the operations of the Senate, and that is uh, Menendez, Senator Menendez, uh, accused of taking bribes, accused of uh, conspiring to act as a foreign agent. You've called for his resignation. Chuck Schumer has not. Is that going to change? Look, I'm just not even 24 hours back from the Middle East. Um, I land and obviously I've been focused on humanitarian corridors, return of American hostages and more. Um, but I said it very clear, as you said. Um, I read the first indictment, not the stunning, shocking things within it. None of them comport with the man that I've known and I've served with for 10 years. He has a right to due process on the criminal proceedings. He has a right to due process on ethical proceedings as well. Um, um, but I do think that politicians should be held to a higher standard. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that was a difficult decision for you to make because I know you have a history with him. But why do you think Senator Schumer hasn't come out and said it's time for you to go under these circumstances? Uh, again, I, I, I think centering him in this is important. He is our leader. Um, but uh, at, at this point, he hasn't done it. Yeah. I respect that. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of, of, of process going on, and Senator Menendez has some very difficult decisions to make. All right. I hear you not wanting to wade into the Schumer part of this, but uh, thank you very much for discussing so much else uh, and for your work in Israel, and, and I look forward and to talking to you more back. about it. Yeah, and you're going back, yeah. And be safe. Senator Cory Booker.